Well, let's have our Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You may be thinking, Paul, I thought you've made your point about all this division stuff. Why don't you just tell them to get along with each other? But really, it's more than that, isn't it? It's for the Corinthians as well as for ourselves. Uh, it's a matter of really missing the mark as far as how to do ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit, the connection that is so important between believers and the head of the church, Jesus Christ. He does repeat himself a little bit, uh, but always with the goal, I think, of pointing the church at Corinth to maturity in Christ. Uh, remember now, these are, he's speaking to uh, believers. There may be some uh, unbelievers within the body of the church, but he's speaking particularly to believers. He's talked about them in chapter 1, about how they had uh, received all the spiritual gifting that they need to do the job of the church that they were tasked with. And uh, he talked about in the first chapter about how uh, God was be faithful to keep them true to the end with regard to that. And even in our chapter this morning, uh, verse 1, he speaks to them again as brothers. So it's important that we understand who this was written to because we can get a little bit fuzzy if we don't, especially when we're talking about uh, things being burned up and all of that. We'll get to that a little bit later. You know, you and I are genuinely concerned, aren't we, when a child fails to reach the points of maturity that's our, that are expected for him or her at a particular age. If a child isn't uh, walking by a certain age, we begin to wonder, oh, is there something wrong? Or, uh, of course, the potty training thing is something else. Uh, but if they're not developing according to the expectations for a particular age, we do get concerned and want to see what, what we can do about it. And Paul is expressing the same kind of concern for these brothers and sisters in Corinth. He had been there, he had established the church, he had stayed there for a year and a half. He was gone now, he was in Ephesus, and uh, as he was there and had heard about the, the behavior of these um, people who were having uh, different followings within the church, uh, he realized that these people were not growing spiritually and uh, demonstrating growth in the spirit uh, as they should be by this time. Yes, of course, there were cultural challenges. This was a largely Gentile church. They didn't have the even the background of the Jewish uh, law system and all of the things that went along with Judaism. Uh, there were particular difficulties in this particular body, uh, but, but Paul is rightly concerned that this church is not developing properly because the individual members are not developing as they should. Uh, we had a lesson last Sunday in John 15 where Christ speaks about the fact that, the, that as he is the vine and the believers are the branches, uh, that there's an expectation that there will be fruit that comes from that. And as we thought about that kind of fruit, um, much of it is wound up in what Paul tells us in Galatians uh, chapter 5 about the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, and uh, those nine characteristics that are true of bearing fruit within the Christian life. Uh, this is what Paul was looking for with regard to the Corinthians, and it didn't seem to be happening. Because life in Jesus it should be developing to the point that you and I are developing a decided family likeness to Jesus Christ. Just a bit of a review of terms I'd like to do before we launch into this. Uh, as we think about the process of salvation, there's a one-time act of our submitting to Jesus Christ and his coming into our life, of our appropriating by faith his sacrifice on Calvary. And we call, we call that salvation. Uh, we call that being born again. Uh, there, there is a one-time point when a believer enters, uh, an unbeliever goes from unbelief to belief. And uh, as John has said earlier in his gospel, goes, passes from death into life. Uh, we call that justification because in a legal sense, as we, as we look at how God sees us, uh, we move from having a, an account 
that is uh, so huge that we could never pay for it because of our sins, uh, having offended God so much. We move from that part of the ledger over into having our account paid by Christ, He having given His life for your sins and mine, and then we move over into His life uh, as we then begin a new life. And that's what we call justification, a one-time thing. Uh, but also included in the whole concept of salvation is the understanding of sanctification, of being made holy, of being separate from uh, the old life and moving into the new. Paul speaks about that in several places in letters that he wrote uh, a little bit later than this. Uh, but sanctification would be growing in righteousness, uh, moving forward in the Christian life, a process rather than a one-time event. And this is what Paul was expecting to see from these uh, Corinthian Christians. In every believer, in every age, there must be a moving from a view of the world that everybody else has to the kind of worldview that comes from Christ, from Him indwelling us, from our understanding of God's Word, and from moving forward in that kind of wisdom. Now, there can be different rates of spiritual growth, but there should be individual growth in every believer uh, as God works in their lives. What Paul was observing in these accounts from the Corinthian church was that they were still stuck in the attitudes and the values of their pagan worldview. What the world considered wise, they were still considering wise and were not uh, having the point of view that Paul mentions over in uh, verse 18 of chapter 1. If you can look just across the page on my Bible at least, Paul says in chapter 1 verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Uh, this message of the cross is more than, well, Jesus died for my sins and now I'm going to heaven. Jesus, especially in, um, as he described uh, being his disciple to the disciples, uh, one particular uh, the outstanding place in Mark chapter 8, he talks about the fact that if, if one is to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, uh, he is to take up his cross daily uh, and follow him. Not just, uh, not just the kind of, oh, I'm really glad I'm saved, but the ad adopting the kind of humble, obedient attitude that Jesus displayed when he went to the cross. And now you and I, believers, are also in the, the mode of our belief. We also assume uh, that hum humble attitude, uh, the attitude of obedience. So the cross is the preaching of the cross. Uh, yes, the cross, just uh, the fact that Jesus uh, was hanged on a cross, was very offensive. It's offensive to us, uh, let alone to those people in that day where, where crucifixions which were more, much more common and where a person who was crucified had to be a really bad person. Uh, in, it's more than just that kind of shame or physical agony. It's moving into the line of how Jesus responded to this and, and ministered to this earth. And so the preaching of that kind of cross, uh, the Greek mind uh, had no, no uh, honoring at all for the concept of humility. It was every man for himself and uh, the person who had the biggest head, so to speak, uh, was the winner. And so when Paul says the preaching of the cross uh, is to foolishness to those who are perishing. He's really speaking from a, a viewpoint of understanding uh, of his culture in that day. So Paul is concerned then, as he enters into chapter 3, uh, about the fact that these Corinthian Christians, as they are uh, kind of having little groups within the church, some following Paul, some following Apollos, some follow, following Peter, and then some who said they were really the best because they followed Christ. Uh, these people uh, are not demonstrating the kind of spiritual growth and maturity that should be expected. And as a result, the testimony and the work of that body of Christ uh, in Corinth was really being hindered. 
Uh, in chapter 3, uh, there, he really gives uh, some very loving but blunt diagnoses of the problem and then gives the solution. And so as we look at this chapter, first of all, we're going to see in verses 1 through 9 that he says to the Corinthian church, your growth is stunted. You're not growing as you should. This is verses 1 to 9. He says, Brothers, I would not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting as mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? Are you not acting like uh, just the men of the world without the value system and without the, the presence of Jesus Christ in them? So he's saying in these first uh, four verses, um, you're still at the baby stage. Uh, I really can't call you spiritual, but I have to call you worldly. Now, if you look up above the page um, in chapter 2 in verses 14 and 15, Paul uses the term spiritual as to contrast those who are uh, spiritual uh, being a saved person and the worldly as being uh, the unsaved person. Uh, but here now, and one of the things that we need to, especially with Paul, because he's such an amazing writer and he has so much to say, we need to be sure that we are tracking as we work through his writings with the context of what he is saying. Uh, and so if we stuck on this uh, unsaved and saved picture that we got in verse in chapter 2, we would, would be off track with regard to how he is treating this in chapter 3. Worldly means dominated by the flesh. You're still back in that kind of uh, value system and your life, uh, the, way, the way you normally acted. Uh, he says, I started you on the right diet. I gave you milk. Uh, by the time I left, you weren't ready for the real strong meat of the word, but of course, uh, implied in that is that who's ever now uh, taking the responsibility of teaching this church is carrying on uh, and should be uh, and probably has been giving them this spiritual meat, but they haven't been responding to it. Uh, you may remember the writer to the Hebrews uh, in chapter 5 talks about the fact how upset he is with the, the people who are, to whom he is writing the letter because uh, they were supposed to be uh, well along in maturity and they still wanted to just hear the same old stuff. They still uh, were just fixated on, on the, the plan of salvation and all of that and they needed to be able to teach people of, of those things but they needed to be ready uh, and delving into the more deep spiritual truths that are a part of the gospel. And this is the same kind of situation that Paul is addressing here. He says, you're acting like mere men. You are uh, still guided by the secular norms, by the secular thinking, because what you think is that who's ever on the top is the one who's the boss and who's the greatest. And so when you say, well, I'm following Paul, you're kind of trying a one-upmanship with regard to that. It's interesting, you know, you can really tell a person's relationship with God by how they treat other people. You can tell a person's relationship with God by how they treat other people. And uh, as Paul was watching these uh, from a distance because it was, uh, he had received this message from Chloe's household, uh, but as he understood what was happening, he realized that these people were not growing. They were failing to thrive in their spiritual walk because they were still hung up on one-upmanship and on who's the best and all of that. Worldliness is demonstrated here as using secular thinking about Christian ministry. Worldliness is using secular kinds of norms uh, who, to... Maybe the person with the most education is the one that you give the, the highest post to, uh, as opposed to Christian uh, ministry where, where God is the one who equips and chooses and works through the one that he chooses as the leader. A mature Christian behavior is characterized 
by humility and concern for others. And these people were not demonstrating that uh, mature Christian behavior. They were self-centered, they were infantile in many ways, spiritually, uh, and they were also really divisive. And so Paul is very, very frank with them about this. Uh, that's the, the kind of thumbnail of what it is that he is saying. But as he goes on in verses 5 through 9, he says, you know, what really happened here? Uh, verse 5, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned each to his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, uh, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. Each has his own assignment. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and you are God's building. Now the building aspect uh, he'll launch into uh, as we begin looking at verses 10 to 17, but uh, he's speaking now in an agricultural mode. And isn't he good about uh, illustrations helping us to understand? We can just about see uh, planting the seed, uh, the foundation we'll look at a little bit later, but planting the seed that then starts to grow um, and then the helpers, the workers, the field hands coming in and uh, water and making sure that the, that the plant is growing. Uh, the Corinthians had focused on, on the guys who were getting it done, and they were not even concentrating on the fact that it was God alone who was giving the uh, fruitfulness, the increase in the ministry that Paul and Apollos and those guys had. As servants, Paul says, we Paul, I and Apollos were not vying against each other for, for who was the best. We each had our own task, and so we, were the, we are the ones then. Uh, I'm the one who, who, who planted the seed, but the seed is the really important thing, and the one who made it grow, the only one who made it grow, is, the one, is God himself. Uh, Apollos helped it grow, uh, but that, but the result as God worked was that God's field was growing. So that's how Paul is, is uh, giving an illustration of what he sees has happened here. Uh, what, what really has happened, and that is that it's all about God, and it's not about Paul or Peter or Apollos or things like that. Uh, and I need to stop here because as I was thinking about this, I thought, uh, you know, it's very easy to kind of plateau spiritually. Uh, to say, well, you know, I'm pretty good. I've got this, this um, habit down, and uh, I, I, I'm pretty comfortable where I am. Uh, and none of us can afford the luxury, no matter how many years we've known and loved the Lord uh, or how new we are to the Christian kingdom. None of us can afford to stop growing because that's what uh, the Christian life is all about. And Paul was disturbed uh, to see that these people were not progressing in their spiritual walk as they, have, as they should have. Uh, it's the task of every believer to keep on growing. God works in us, but we certainly have to cooperate with him. Uh, and as you and I grow in him, then the local body of believers, which is what Paul is referring to specifically here, that local body of believers profits as you and I become more like Christ and we're able to be, be better members of the local body, or as we might say, members of the body of Christ. So Paul has uh, talked about the fact that their growth was stunted. They were plateaued. Uh, but now in verse 10, uh, he moves into the area of saying, your building, quote and unquote, your building is at risk. Your building is at risk. He begins to move into now uh, the uh, picture of now a building that had uh, had the foundation laid, and then uh, the superstructure was being cons was being constructed. Verse ten, he says, "By the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it." 
But each one should be careful ab about how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Paul talks actually about three kinds of builders, three uh, ones that uh, build on the foundation that is laid, that is Jesus Christ. He talks uh, of, of himself in, in verse 10 as an expert builder. This is, not, this is not bragging. It's just understanding the role that God has given him. He also mentions that uh, in verse 14, the one whose work survives, uh, that person is the uh, expert builder. In verse 15, he talks about a person who does not, uh, who does not uh, ha build with the correct materials, who is using shoddy materials or even perhaps something that doesn't belong there. That's, uh, that's the uh, unwise builder. So we have the expert builder, the unwise builder, and then we also have the destructive builder because in verse 17, which I didn't get to yet, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. So there is even a possibility of a person uh, seeming to build on the foundation of Christ and yet uh, in such a destructive way uh, that uh, the building is at risk. So let's think about what Paul is saying starting in verse 10. Paul's role was to take the gospel to new places. He had that fire in his belly, didn't he? he? He was happiest when he was preaching the gospel to people who had never heard. In fact, uh, at the end of the uh, letter to the Romans, while he is uh, in Roman captivity, uh, he mentions that the, his, when, he, when he's freed, he's going to go to Spain because those people haven't heard the gospel yet. He's looking, always looking forward. He was really the entrepreneur uh, in the gospel role. Other people had the role of, of, of then building the edifice, putting each of the, uh, the rooms together in each of the stories. Uh, the foundation he laid in every place was Jesus Christ. There was no other basis for uh, the church to be the body of Christ, but it had to be this gospel message that he talked about in chapter 1, uh, the preaching of the cross, uh, the gospel. This is what he talked this is how he then laid the foundation of the church. In, in verse uh, 12, 13, and 14, uh, we have this picture of the different kinds of building materials. Those that would remain uh, when they were passed through the judgment uh, and those that would um, be burned up and, and would not remain. And let's think about that a little bit. He says um, in verse 13, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. A day in this sentence, in, at least in my translation of the Bible, is uh, capitalized, the day. Uh, and he would have taught the, these Corinthian people about the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the day of Christ's return, the day when all the accounts are settled and when uh, those who have um, been serving in the cause of Christ have an opportunity to be rewarded for those things that uh, God has enabled them to do and their submission to him. Um, and it's a, a concept that we don't always uh, think about, but uh, he's usually uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, judgment is symbolized by fire. A uh, number of pictures in the Old Testament that give us that. Uh, and so when he talks about the fact that um, the fire will test the quality of each man's work, this is, the, this is a picture of the judgment of God. Uh, and you may be saying, well, you know, I thought once I was born again, I'm not going to ever be involved in judgment. Um, Paul is, helps us 
uh, in his second letter to these Corinthian Christians. And if you'll turn with me over to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, he has one comment that I think is really, really helps us in understanding what he's been, what he's talking about in using another picture uh, in our passage for today. But in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, verse, let's, um, verse 9, let's start there. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from him. Of course, the the delight of every believer is to please the Lord Jesus Christ and in that way please God the Father as well. Uh, but he says, in, uh, so we make it our aim or our goal to please, please him. For, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, uh, good or bad. And so there is an understanding that although believers will never be charged with their sins again, that there will be an opportunity for those who have uh, given service to the Lord, uh, loved Him supremely, and given Him uh, the very, very best, those who have built on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, uh, they will receive a reward uh, in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 4, uh, there's, John has a picture of the throne of God and uh, the, all of the wonderful praising and worshiping that's going on. And it, he talks about the fact that there are 24 elders. Uh, probably uh, the, these 24 would be representing the, the uh, 12 tribes plus the 12 apostles, uh, representing then all of us, and they would be throwing their crowns down at the base of this throne, so out of honor, uh, having something to give to God himself. And that may be the picture that's carrying through. We have a fire in 1 Corinthians. We have a, a judgment seat, a court kind of situation that's pictured in, in 2 Corinthians. And then we have something that uh, appears to be uh, some those who have received uh, rewards for what they have done because they have uh, built with, with uh, material that will withstand the fire. Uh, they will, and they will have received a reward, uh, as he says in 2 Corinthians, those people will then have the privilege of offering these things that, that they have been given back to the one uh, who saved them and who has provided everything that they need. Um, the um, ones who build with wood, hay, or straw, uh, if as the fire of God's judgment also comes upon those products, uh, those would be very combustible, of course, and they would not remain. And so Paul giving the picture, if what he built survives, he will receive the reward. But verse 15, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. We speak about somebody uh, escaping a fire with the clo only the clothes on their back. And this is the picture that Paul uh, is using here. Uh, what kind of building are these, these people doing that, that has, does not last to eternity? Uh, it, there we, we could figure out from other passages of Scripture how we might begin to uh, work with the list, but clearly they're not giving... Uh, the building on the edifice of the, the building the edifice on the foundation that Paul has laid, they're not building with the truth. Uh, they may be uh, thinking of only of themselves. They may be uh, giving forth a, a good message, but it's with a selfish uh, motive. Uh, they may even be twisting the truth so that it sounds more appealing, they think, to, uh, to the person that, who's listening. That would certainly not be anything that would stand withstand the fire of God's judgment. Uh, and they might, sadly, but they might be actually building with bad materials uh, so that the building would collapse if we're using that uh, uh, picture. And of course, those people uh, would be teaching falsehoods within the church. So th those are possibilities of the ones who have, would have their uh, works be burned up in, in this picture that God is giving that Paul is giving, excuse me. Um, 
remember now, these people are believers. He's talking about brothers, and so he's talking about the possibility of believers building with good, lasting, eternal materials, or believers building with materials that are more, are more selfish, that are more um, worldly, that don't fit the, the beauty and the um, substance of what is the truth. Uh, that there may be within these builders, uh, in the story that Paul is telling, there may be some unbelievers. Uh, because we do know Jesus taught that uh, there, within the, the Christian community, the, the outward workings of the Christian community, there can be people who say that they're believers. Remember Jesus tells a parable about the fact that uh, people come to him in the judgment and they say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Uh, didn't we do that in your name? And he says, I never knew you. So it's possible about that, but it seems that Paul is mostly concerned here not about an unbeliever who's an infiltrated the church as much as he's concerned about these people who are, are clearly not putting forth the kind of humble and submissive and obedient uh, spirit that will help this church grow. Uh, verse 16, don't you know, he's still on the, on the topic of the fact that your building now is really at risk. He says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? Uh, Paul, uh, throughout this letter, is going to use the phrase, don't you know? Uh, and what, it's, what he's going to be meaning is, uh, you can't refute this. It, it has, you know that this is true. Uh, you, that you are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you. You had a note in your workbook uh, this week that said that uh, the, the personal pronoun you, uh, in this case, is plural in the Greek. There is a uh, verse in chapter 6 that we'll look at later that is um, the singular, which would mean the individual uh, believer. But here, uh, it seems that Paul, with the plural pronoun, is speaking to the church at large in this particular place. And he says, don't you know that you're God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? It's a wonderful thing to be indwelt by God's spirit. That's our agent of spiritual life. Um, temples in that day were built to glorify the person to whom the temple was dedicated. And as we read through the Old Testament, we know uh, that, that Solomon gathered just huge amounts of valuable material to put into this temple, which was not a very large building, uh, but it was glorious. It was beautiful. It was just packed with uh, wealth with regard to that uh, because it was for the glory of the Almighty God. Uh, and so he says, you know, you, you believers in Corinth are indeed a temple that is designed to bring glory to God. Uh, you are to enhance the beauty of God and give forth his message. Uh, and if you're quarreling, if you're uh, against each other instead of looking uh, to God, uh, what you're going to do, he says in verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Um, the temple is the body of Christ, the local body of Christ, uh, and we ourselves as well are designed to glorify God. The Westminster Catechism speaks of the fact, what is the chief end of man? And it's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And, he, and so Paul in verse 17 is saying, you know, God really cares about his temple. And if somebody is going to be destructive about that temple, he has every right and will destroy that, that person. We don't know what that looks like exactly, although later on in this letter he's going to speak about some people who had been misusing the Lord's Supper. And he said, some of them are sick and even some of them have died uh, because God took them out. He, he will not stand for the way that they were abusing uh, this privilege, uh, a beautiful thing that the church has. And it's possible that this is the kind of thing that Paul is referring to here. God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. He's not going to let uh, someone truly demolish that temple without 
having uh, some, uh, a say in it. Um, if a person, in, as they work within the local church, makes it impossible for the spirit to work, um, God's not going to stand for that. He is going to make sure that something happens uh, that, that will remove that person so that his work uh, can go forth. God takes seriously those who mess with the Church of Christ. Being God's temple is something to value and something to uh, enhance his glory. So he says your temple, your building is at risk in verses 10 to 17. But then in verses 18 to 23, he wraps this up by saying, your values are faulty. Your values are faulty. Uh, the root cause for the dissension uh, was worldly pride. Verse 18, do not deceive yourself. If anyone thinks that he is wise by the standards of this age, uh, he should become a fool, quote and unquote, so that he may become wise. The solution for uh, getting out of this cycle of having the factions in the church is for a person to understand that um, he may be pretty wise in this world's learning, but in spiritual learning, he needs to be a fool to know nothing so that he can then be uh, humble enough to, under, to learn how to operate uh, in, uh, according to the values of the kingdom. They were deceived about what really mattered in the work of the church. He says, uh, for the wisdom of this world, verse 19, is foolishness in God's sight. I want to I just stop for a moment to say, you know, within every body of Christ, local body of Christ, here at First Baptist Church in San Antonio, as well as, as other churches, um, God has provided people who have expertise, financial expertise, counseling expertise, this kind of thing, uh, working with, within their worldly education uh, in a spiritual way with spiritual gifts so that they can be of value to the church. Uh, so we don't look down on people who have education. Uh, if a person uh, needs to be uh, a part of a very complex congregation and needs to know how to be a leader, how to be, administer things, uh, there are certain things that would be required of them. So Paul isn't saying uh, that you just, you know, let's just have this whole thing be for dummies. That's not the case, but if you're depending on that, instead of the work of the Spirit in moving you forward in the ministry, uh, then he says, uh, this is not the wisdom that God uh, uses in his work. He says, uh, verse, still in verse 19, he quotes from Job. He says, uh, as it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Uh, and then uh, from a psalm as well, he says, uh, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, he says, what's the solution? Well, verse 21, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos, Cephas or the world, or life or death, or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. What does he mean by that? Uh, all are, you have everything you need. Well, we do know that, and Peter mentions this, that uh, in his, I think it's the first uh, epistle, that God has given to us in Jesus Christ everything that we need for life and godliness. Uh, and so they needed to learn how to use and access and revel in the spiritual realities that they have been given as they have uh, come to Christ. He says, if you have, if you belong to Christ, what do you have? Uh, you have all things because you have all things in Christ. You have all that you need, all that you need for this particular ministry, all that you need for life and godliness. And he says, if you have Christ, then you have God because Christ is of God. God has provided for his church, for his believers, everything that they need uh, as they grow in him. And that's where Paul is really working at moving these people forward with regard to that. He'll go on in chapter 4 uh, next week uh, to use his, himself and the apostles as, as an example of some of, of this. Uh, but uh, I thought about the fact that even at the end of Paul's life, he was convinced that he had not arrived yet. 
Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, uh, which is one of his late, latest, later letters, uh, he talks about uh, how uh, he sees his life. In verse 10, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect. He's sitting in prison for the cause of Christ, and yet he's saying, I'm not there yet, he says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Uh, Paul never didn't practice what he preached. Uh, he was a, on a continual growth curve with regard to the Lord. And even as well as he knew Christ uh, in, these, in these later days of his life, he still says, I'm not there yet. I'm looking forward. My goal uh, is to gain the prize of being with Christ. So is it a time for a reality check of your values? Uh, are you operating according to worldly wisdom, according to the stuff you read? in the magazines or see on TV or the kinds of things that were your cultural heritage? Uh, or do you look more and more like Jesus Christ? Is that a characteristic of your life and mine? Not perfect, but on the growth mode. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Paul. Uh, thank you for his courage to write to these Corinthian believers because he cared for them so much. Uh, thank you for these words of wisdom. I pray that you will uh, give us uh, a view of ourselves and our spiritual growth, uh, our passion for you, our desire to serve you, uh, that will grow us up in you so that we will be thriving according to how you expect us to be um, working on the edifice, to be uh, getting uh, the kinds of things from you that we can give to others so that you will be pleased and we will have uh, an opportunity in the last day to give you the glory for all of this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.